State PTA. I don't know if I have had the opportunity to meet you all in person. Um, I hope I have, but um, we'll be chatting this evening for a little bit about nominations and elections. If any of you were at our convention in November, you will, would have experienced a huge process, uh, the election process. We had nominations from the floor and we had a, a full-blown election. It wasn't just a voice vote election. So um, it's an exciting process and especially when it's done properly, it is uh, a very smooth and democratic process. Um, just so you know, the information on nominations and elections are found in our resource guide, which is located on the New York State PTA website, www.nyspta.org. There's a leader section, and under there, there's a drop down for the resource guide, and then you'll find all of the sections of the guide. I did have sent to you a PDF file with the resource guide. Um, that is the most current version of it. However, when there are updates made, um, the PDF is updated on the website. So if it's a little while before you are ready for your process, check back in online um, to that section of the resource guide in case there were any updates made from the time that you received the PDF. Hey, Grace, do you mind if I interrupt for just a second? The Not link, at all. The link to the resource guide that was in the email, it links to the actual PDF that's on the website. Yeah. So, so you just, okay. just check back in when it gets updated. Okay. All right. Terrific. And I think also what we're doing is we are um, sending out notification where you'll notice when you go to that web page, if something's been updated, they put the word new or updated next to it on the website. Is that correct, Amy? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yep. I flag stuff is new. Okay, and I would also like to introduce everybody to Amy Tweedy. She is uh, one of the staff members for New York State PTA. She is our communications uh, manager, and so she is our cruise director here tonight with our technology. So thanks, Amy, for joining Hi, us. Hi, Nick. You're welcome. I'm going <clears> to <throat> mute myself again. Okie doke. Okay, so we're going to start out here with about where leadership begins. Um, in order to have officers for a PTA, you go through a nominating committee process. And even if it's a brand new chartered PTA, uh, you will have elected a nominating committee to um, select individuals whose names will be put forward to be put into election to office. And so this committee is the most responsible um, committee in your PTA. Um, they are to be elected according to what your bylaws have to say. If you have had the experience where people just volunteer to be on the nominating committee and haven't been elected, that process has not been done properly. Um, there must be an actual election. Even if there are only the number of individuals that are needed to be on the committee, they have to be elected. They cannot just be appointed to the committee. Um, the Election of the committee should take place at least 60 days before the election of officers, but if it's possible for you to do so earlier in the year, that's really the best um, the way that you're going to have the best opportunity to um, witness how people act as PTA members, um, how, what their leadership skills are, and so forth. So you have to do it within the number of days that it says as a minimum, but it doesn't mean that you can't elect sooner than that. So if your bylaws tell you that it's 60 days, it has to be within 60 days, but you can do it sooner than 60 days. So we're gonna just, I am not gonna be able to see the, the answers that you type in. I'll actually go off of here, I guess. Um, how many people think that they an can answer correctly the following questions? Why should you have a nominating committee? Who are the people who elect the nominating committee? What is the charge of the nominating committee? When is the nominating committee elected? And where is the nominating committee elected? Um, I'm gonna actually go off of this PowerPoint slide to see if anybody has typed in an answer for this. And we'll see if 
how knowledgeable our group is. Oh, and I see nobody has answered the question, <laughs> any of the questions. All right, we're going to come, we're going to see what the answers are as we go through the presentation. Um, obviously, this is a little bit different than when you are in person having a, a workshop um, where we can be interactive with each other. We don't have the ability to have people ask questions as the slides go by, but I ask that you maybe jot down any questions that come up as I'm going through the PowerPoint slides. And then after I've gotten through the presentation, if your question hasn't been answered, type it up in the chat box and we'll answer the question for you. So let's move along to the next slide, <clears throat> which talks about your bylaws. <coughs> I hope that um, all of you have had access to your bylaws because the most important information related to your nominating committee and the elections are contained within the bylaws. Um, if you do not have them and you are not the president of the unit, ask your president for a copy of those. All members of a PTA unit are entitled to access to your unit bylaws. They really should have hard copies available for the members. If you're having difficulty getting those from your president, you can contact your region director and she'll connect you with your region bylaws chair or possibly your region may have their own website that lists the names of the bylaw chairs for your regions. Um, if you're not sure which region you're from, take a look at the New York State PTA website. We have a map on there that shows you geographically throughout New York State which region you would belong to. And then you would have a, a, a bylaws chair that is responsible for the bylaws for all of the units and councils within your region. The bylaws are the laws that your unit has voted to um, put into place for your particular PTA, whether you're a unit or a council. So within your bylaws, you're going to find out what the composition of the committee is. So that means um, how many well, members that, are from you. How many members are from Not your executive committee? How many members are from your executive board? How many members are from your general membership? And also, if there are alternates for each of those different bodies, how many they are and when they would be elected. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, if you're not completely familiar with the different bodies of a PTA unit, the largest body which encompasses everybody is your general membership. And that's any individual who has purchased a PTA membership. They are considered a general member. The individuals who are the chairman and um, maybe your council delegates are part of the executive board of your PTA. And then finally, the executive committee are individuals who are elected to office. So that would be your presidents, vice presidents, treasurers, secretaries. Um, and in some instances, the council delegates are also elected um, officers of the PTA. That information is going to be contained within your particular unit bylaws. It's also going to tell you which officers are elected and how long their term of office is. So in some cases, it's that everybody is elected each year into a position. Um, in some instances, the elections are staggered. For example, in New York State PTA, in one year, the president, the first vice president, the secretary, and a vice president are elected. And then in the following year, two vice presidents, a treasurer and the treasurer are elected. So it's sort of on a rotating basis. Um, again, in your bylaws, it's going to tell you how long the term of office is. Typically, an, a term is one year with the ability to be renominated and reelected for a second year. That would be one term. In some cases, a term is considered two years. And so the individual would be elected once and they would serve for two years. So again, that information is in your PTA bylaws. The bylaws are going to tell you how your council delegates are selected. 
if your PTA is not part of a council, then this would not apply to you. But if your PTA is part of the council, there's going to be information on whether those delegates are appointed by your executive committee or if they're elected by the membership when the officer elections take place. It's also going to let you know when the committee is going to report and publish the slate. Sometimes it doesn't happen until the election meeting, but more times than not, there's notification given about a month or so prior to the meeting. That's specified in your bylaws. It will also tell you the date of the election meeting. Typically, they take place in the general member meeting in the springtime, but your unit could have selected another point in time to have that election. And then it will also tell you what to do with a vacancy. And that means that somebody has either stepped down from an office or there could be a situation where um, there's the nominating committee comes forward and there is not an individual listed on the slate. Okay. The unit bylaw information regarding nominations and elections are found in Article 7, and the council bylaws pattern has it in Article 8, officers and their election. So section two defines when they're elected and what the method is and the terms of eligibility and terms of office. Some PTAs will decide that an individual has to have served on their board for one or two years before they're eligible for an election to an officer position. Some PTAs don't have a prerequisite for that. But if your PTA has selected to do that, you're going to find that in your bylaws in section two. Section three is going to tell you about the nominating committee itself, what the composition of that committee is. Is it two members from the executive board and three from the general membership or three from the general from the executive board, two from the general membership? And also um, when their report is given and how the nominations can be made from the floor. There are some PTAs that specify that notification has to be given within a certain number of days prior to the election if somebody is going to the run from the floor. And there are some PTAs that allow nominations to be made randomly from the floor at the election without any prior notification. But again, your PTA is going to have specified that and it will be listed in your bylaws. Section number four is going to talk about how to deal with the vacancy in office. So <clears throat> you should be familiar with what the different offices are and um, what the responsibilities of those roles are before you discuss that with um, any of the potential nominees. And finally, section eight, excuse me, article eight, section one, will speak to you about council delegates. I'm not sure if all of the people that are on this call are presently elected as nominating com committee members or if you are the president of your unit and are just trying to find out about how it works. But right now we'll talk about nominating committee members themselves. Hopefully you're going to have a combination of people on the committee who have had experience on a nominating committee before and some people who are brand new. And you really should try to do this with everything in your PTA that you're sort of mentoring new people along the way by pairing them up with people who have had experience before. Um, more often than not, there is not a prerequisite that a person has to have been on the PTA for a certain amount of time before they can be a member of the nominating committee, but you have to check for that as well. The people who are elected to the nominating committee should be elected because they are the right candidates and they're going to do the job properly and not because um, it's a popularity contest and somebody's trying to run some sort of an agenda. Um, so you, you really want to find the best qualified candidates to be on your nominating committee. They need to be aware of what the responsibility of, of being a member of the nominating committee is. And members of the nominating committee should be provided with all of the materials, such as your bylaws, your procedures, the job descriptions for the different officers, um, so that they will be able to 
make an educated decision when they're nominating individuals. These people should also know about PTA. They shouldn't be total strangers to your PTA unit. They should know um, what the purpose of the PTA is. They should know what the goals of your PTA unit are. And they should be familiar with the different programs that you run in your PTA. They should also have some sort of a knowledge of the people who they are going to consider to be nominating for the officer positions. Um, but there are a variety of ways that you're going to get this information. So it's not that every person on the committee has to know every single member of your PTA. Um, but I would think that if you have a committee of five or se seven members, more than likely somebody's going to know at least one of the nominees. They also have to be the kind of be people that can be objective when they are considering um, individuals. You sort of have to take your personal feelings out of this when you are working as a member of a nominating committee and you're going to be looking at what is in the best interest of your PTA. Um, you need to be able to speak your mind and to be able to speak up for what you believe is correct. Um, you're going to use good judgment when you are considering individuals and not make it based on personal feelings. Um, you're going to be an individual who's going to be discreet and you're not, you're certainly not going to share any of the information that was discussed during the nominating committee meetings once you are finished with, um, with your meetings. It's very, very important that the discussions are, remain confidential for a variety of reasons. Um, certainly, you wouldn't want an individual's feelings to be hurt. And um, you want, you would, because you need to be very honest with each other about the um, abilities of the individuals that you're discussing. So you want to keep that information contained within that, that committee. Okay. So when the committee meets, you want to have a full committee. And in some situations, a, an individual might not be able to, not may not be available to meet with the group. And that's when you would be able to use your alternates. That's when you would be able to use alternates if they have been specified, specified in your bylaws. So for example, you may have somebody that unexpectedly has to go out of town. And if your committee was a committee of five, you're going to want to have five individuals present. So you would, if you are able to um, elect alternates according to your bylaws, the individual who was elected to be an alternate from the general membership would replace a general member um, representative on the nominating committee and an individual who was from the executive board as an alternate would replace an executive board representative on the committee. You would not interchange um, the alternates. They would have to come from that same grouping that was elected. They would be elected by ballot just as the other members of the nominating committee are elected and they need to receive a majority vote in order to be elected to the committee. And that goes for the entire committee as a whole. When the individuals are elected, they must be elected by a majority. If there are only the number of um, members required being elected, it would be the individuals with the highest number of votes. And then the person with the lowest number of votes would be the alternate. Okay, preparing for the meeting. And this goes for all the members of the committee. It doesn't just go for the, the chairman of the committee. You're going to want to review your bylaws well in advance, the procedures and the job descriptions. Make yourself very familiar with those before you get to the meeting and bring those documents along with you when you go to the meeting. Um, at this point in time, if your PTA does not have procedures or job descriptions, this would be a good goal for them for this coming year to write procedures up for the nominating committee. You're going to review the nominations and elections check checklist, and you received a copy of that as one of the handouts 
um, I don't know the number of it, but it was specified as one of the handouts. Make sure that you have, print out all of those documents that were sent to you so that you have everything for your meeting, but review that checklist as you're going through the process so that you know that you have done everything that you need to do um, through the entire, entire um, process. Nobody um, should reach out to any of the individuals to ask their willingness to hold office before the committee meets. So please do not have a conversation with anybody um, about whether they want to, you know, to be nominated to a particular office. That is a decision that the committee is going to make as a whole. And then later on, if you decide that you are going to nominate a specific individual, the chairman of the committee will um, make contact with that person. But please don't reach out and let somebody know that you're considering them for the position in advance. It may turn out, turn out that that's not the individual whose name is put forward and you're going to put yourself into an awkward position. You're going to want to send out recommendation forms to your membership so that they can give input to you for potential nominees. And I have a sample of the letter to the membership. Um, explaining the process that's going to take place. This is one of your handouts, and all of the handouts that have been provided are uh, Word documents so that you can modify them for your own PTA unit. So the first document that I'm showing you is the cover letter that would go to the membership, and the second document that I'm showing you now is a recommendation form. And what you would want to do with this is, if you notice, it says the blank PTA, and then underneath that it says president. I made a notation that you would change the title for each position, and you'd want to have one of these forms prepared for president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, whatever the particular officers are that you will be um, nominating to be elected. Okay, now the person who's the chairman. The chairman is the individual who's going to pretty much schedule everything related to the nominating committee and be responsible for preparing all of the materials. You, it would be better for you to reach out to all of the members of the committee to find a mutually convenient date. And now they have available doodle poll. I'm sure most people are familiar with it so that you can sort of take an electronic survey and you'd be, you know, by putting out a few different dates, you can see the date that everybody is available. You want to make an effort to have the meeting when all of the members can attend. Once you have come to a decision on what the date will be, you're going to need to notify everybody of that information. And um, you're also going to notify your alternates of that as well. The alternates will not come to the meeting unless one of the elected members are unable to attend the meeting. So when the committee meets, it's only going to be the committee members. The alternates don't come, you know, and participate unless one of the members cannot participate um, in the meeting. You're going to ask for, from your president and other board members for input. So they should fill out those evaluation forms as well, uh, not evaluation, excuse me, those recommendation forms as well regarding um, members of your PTA. The other thing that you can do is hopefully at your PTA meetings, you're taking attendance. You can ask your secretary for a copy of the attendance sheet so you can get an idea of an individual's involvement and as far as are they true to their commitment to PTA. Do they come to all of the meetings or do they show up just once in a while? You want somebody who really shows some dedication. Um, the contact of the, of the nominees is only going to happen after the committee has agreed um, on a specific individual. You're not going to contact anybody prior to that. The chairman is going to inform the committee members um, of the results of the calls. Now, you're going to try to make the calls while all of the committee is present, but sometimes you will not be able to reach everybody that you're looking to nominate. And if that's the case, the chairman is going to continue, you know, possibly in the evening or the next day to call these individuals. Once the chairman has contacted everybody, they will let the committee members know that they've 
contacted the individuals and the individuals have accepted the nomination. And then finally, the chairman is going to send ex what's known as an acceptance letter to the nominee. On my next slide, I have a sample of, oh, excuse me, not the next slide, it's gonna be after this one. Um, another responsibility of the chairman is to notify the president that the slate has been completed. Um, when you speak with your nominees, you're going to let them know when the election is and when the installation is. Just so that everybody knows, an installation is not um, a requirement for the individual to be present for. Once they've been elected, they are elected. An installation is more of a ceremonial event. And there have been times where people can't be present for that, but they are still elected to their officer or to their officer position. If something happens that a nominee, you know, you've made all your nominations, you've called, everybody's accepted the positions, and then the chair gets a call back from the individual who is nominated to be a vice president, and the person says, you know what, I, I actually can't do it. So what would happen in that case is the committee is going to reconvene and they are going to nominate another individual for that position. The committee is going to complete a report that needs to be signed by all of the members of the committee and that report is going to be presented and submitted to the secretary. Any notes that you've taken should be destroyed if you are using ballots while you're meeting as a nominating committee, which is actually a very good idea um, so that you can know, you can be true to yourself in supporting or not supporting an individual. Sometimes it's a little bit awkward if you are having a voice vote and you need to use a ballot. If you do use the ballots, you're going to destroy those at the end of the committee meeting. You're going, the chairman is going to make sure that the names of the individuals who were nominated are published the way they're supposed to be. Um, again, this is something that's found in your bylaws and you need to be sure that that information has been done so properly. And then the chairman is the individual who is going to present the report of the nominating committee at the election meeting. When you have the nominating committee meeting, please do not do this in a public area. Don't have it at a Panera Bread or some outside location. Do this somewhere that's going to be private. You never know who's around and who may hear what you're speaking about. If it's possible for you to hold the meeting in, in the home, that would probably be the best um, option for you. Um, otherwise, I would recommend having a private meeting room. Sometimes a library will have a, a room that has a door on it so that outside people can't hear what you're speaking about. You should have a telephone so that you can call your nominees. Um, the people who were elected are the only people who can attend the meeting. So your president is not a member of your nominating committee and cannot be present um, at that meeting. And any other individual, as you can see on the slide, we list here the superintendent, the principal, the administrator, the only reason that they would be present is if for some reason they were elected to the nominating committee. Again, your bylaws, your job descriptions, and the eligible, eligibility list should be available. So, some PTA units do have requirements for you to be eligible for office, and if that's the case, you need to be fully aware of what those requirements are so you don't accidentally nominate an individual who is not um, able to be um, able to serve as a leader at that point in time. There's a handout that you received um, call, that describes qualities of a good leader. And that's something that you should all be familiar with prior to meeting. And it's something that you should have there at your meeting so that if you start discussing somebody who is possibly not a good candidate for position, by referring to some of those qualities, it will help you to possibly eliminate moving forward with somebody that wouldn't be a, a, a good candidate. You're going to consider each of the individuals very carefully. The first thing that's most important is that the individual is a member of your PTA unit. They need to be somebody who's supportive of PTA and not um, 
somebody who is in opposition of PTA positions and somebody who is an argumentative person um, at your meetings, I would not recommend you nominate somebody like that. Um, oftentimes we have calls come in through our regions with PTA units that are having problems with individuals who are elected to office. And we find that people are renominated and it's like you say to yourself, why are you nominating somebody who's given you a problem? Why are you renominating somebody who's been a problem for your PTA? So make sure that it's somebody that's going to be a really good ambassador for PTA. The person should believe in the purposes of PTA. They should have some experience, um, particularly for the office of president or vice president. Positions such as secretary or treasurer are more skills oriented. And so an individual um, could be considered for those positions based on some of their outside experience rather than PTA experience. Um, they should have knowledge of the organization. They should be able to work well with other people. If you have somebody who frequently causes problems in your PTA, that's not the type of person that I would recommend you nominate. Um, they should be people who are fair and objective. It's not, when we work in PTA, it's not about our own personal feelings, but what's good for the association and especially what's good for the children. So you're going to want to look for individuals who have that type of a mindset. And you also want to look for people who um, have a proven track record of doing their jobs properly and completing their responsibilities. You're not going to, I wouldn't recommend, I shouldn't say you're not going to, but I wouldn't recommend that if you have somebody who served as a chairman and, for example, they were the chairman of the book fair and they never, you know, turned in the money or they placed the order not in a timely fashion. That's not the kind of person that you would want to be nominating to an officer position at that particular point in time. I would give them some more time to develop their skills um, so that you know that the PTA work is going to be carried out properly. Okay. Let me just see here. Okay. Selecting nominees. This is important. Oh. We have some questions coming in. We will we'll address them once we get through all of the slides here. Selecting the nominees. You're going to look at what type of leadership you want for your particular PTA unit. Um, check first to see the individuals that are currently serving in the officer positions, um, whether they are eligible to continue for another term in their position, or if they've completed the amount of time that has been specified for that particular position. So for example, you have a president who served one term and they're eligible to serve for two terms um, and they've only completed one year. That individual would be eligible for renomination to that position. If you had a president who was nominated and elected to serve for two years, two terms, they would no longer be eligible to be renominated to that position. All of the officer terms are for one year, unless for some reason your particular PTA unit has selected a two-year term. In that case, they're only nominated and elected one time after the two years they've completed their position. And it's very important for you to try your hardest not to just move people around from one position to the other. The idea is for people to move up the ladder they um, are learning and being mentored along the way until they move to that position of president. You want to try to continue to develop new leadership and to bring new people into your PTA. If you keep recirculating the same people, you're going to find that in a very short amount of time, other individuals are not going to want to join your PTA and become leaders in your PTA because they're going to feel as though it's a click. Um, you want to think carefully about other people um, and what their ability would be, what their ability to work well with others is, and if they would have sufficient time to do the job. I think I just slipped. Let me go back. Okay. The nominating committee is going to nominate one individual to serve each of the offices that are open. What you're going to do, though, is you're going to develop 
sort of your A slate and then your B slate. And these would be the individuals if the first person um, does not accept the nomination from you, that you have somebody next in line to call. Um, you really want to have everybody in agreement as much as possible on each of the positions. Um, but as long as you have a majority in favor of an individual to be nominated for a position, you're good to move ahead. You really do not want to put a past president into um, one of the positions. They really can be used in other ways as a past president, as a mentor to individuals, because you want to bring in new leadership for your PTA. And again, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that all of the deliberations need to remain confidential. Um, you do not want any of the information that was discussed to go out to the public. Once you have your slate selected, the chairman of the committee is going to make contact with all of the individuals. I know that I mentioned this before, but I can't be clear enough about this. Um, it's not up to any other member of the committee to make those calls. It is the responsibility of the chairman. If at all possible, if these calls can be made while you are together as a committee, that would be really great. But, you know, we realize sometimes you're not able to contact an individual at that moment in time, and you do have to wait until later on to reach that person or to wait to hear back from them if you've left a message that you've called. Um, we strongly stress that you not talk somebody into accepting a position. If they're not really, um, for, you know, fully prepared to accept a role, more than likely they're not going to be happy in that role and they're not going to perform very well. You may wind up with them stepping down from the position. So if somebody's not really ready, willing, and able to accept a role, don't talk them into it. Here's a copy of an acceptance letter. The chairman of the committee is going to send the acceptance letter to each of the nominees. So they're going to sign that they've been nominated for a particular position and that they are willing to accept that position. Those um, acceptance letters need to be submitted to your secretary to be kept on file with the PTA records. The acceptance letter is going to be sent to each of the people, as I just mentioned, and they're going to be returned to the chairman. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the written report is going to be signed by each member of the nominating committee, and it's going to be presented at the election meeting by the chairman. The nominating committee, their work is done once the report has been presented. And that is the only role at the meeting of the chairman to present the report. I have been present where the chair of the nominating committee ran the election, and that is not um, the role of the chair. That is the role of the president. So the nominating committee chair presents the report, and then the president takes over for the election itself. And on the next slide, I'm showing you a sample of the report of the nominating committee. And um, it's pretty straightforward. You can adjust the wording on the Microsoft Word document for your particular PTA unit, and everybody is going to sign that. And then once the report is presented, you'll give that to the secretary to go on, on file. Now, just to d deal with uh, resignations. As we mentioned before, if one of the nominees resigns before the election takes place, then the nominating committee has the ability to meet again and to put another name forward. Um, if the election has taken place and an officer resigns from the position, then that is not the responsibility of the nominating committee any longer. Your bylaws are going to indicate about holding a special meeting to fill the vacancy by the executive board. And so, again, that is not the responsibility of the nominating committee if that resignation occurs after the election has taken place. A few do's and don'ts for you. Some of the things that you do want to do are um, 
consider membership on the nominating committee as an honor and a privilege, as well as a responsibility. You're going to look for the best qualified people for the positions. You're going to keep all of your talks confidential. You're going to tell the nominees all of the details about the job. Don't try to um, make it sound easier than it is or like less worse than it is, less work than it is. Be honest about that. Um, and then you want to definitely think about bringing new people on. You want to have some seasoned people, but you also want to bring new people on so that your PTA will continue to flourish. You don't want to consider the role on the nominating committee to be an imposition on your time because this is the most important committee in your PTA unit. Um, if you don't feel that you are able to fill the role, then don't take the um, position of being a member of the nominating committee. Definitely do not nominate individuals who just think that it's their turn to have an, an officer position. Um, and don't nominate people because they're your friends. Nominate individuals who are the best qualified candidates for the role. Again, the confidentiality comes into place. Do not speak about any of the discussions that took place as the nominating committee once you are completed with your job. With the individuals, don't tell them that it's not a big job because it is. Um, it is a big responsibility. And you have to realize a PTA unit really is a business. It's a nonprofit organization and you are responsible for the funds of that PTA. You have fiduciary responsibilities and, and other types of responsibility. So it is, it is a big deal when you are elected to an officer position in a PTA. And this is most important. We want to be as inclusive as inclusive as we possibly can be. So don't go on a first impression of you know what a person looks like. Go on the qualifications of the individual and the individuals who are the best qualified to serve as the officers in your PTA. When it's time to hold the election, you're going to check again in the bylaws because that's going to tell you when the meeting is taking place. As I mentioned earlier, it's typically at the annual meeting of the PTA, which takes place in the springtime. The bylaws are going to tell you how many days prior notification is needed. Sometimes it's five days, sometimes it's a week, um, but it's important that you follow that because if there is some issue with the election and proper notification was not given, the election can be um, turned over and you don't want to do that. You're going to check again in your procedures and your bylaws about when the nominating committee report is to be published. And I know I'm reiterating some of these things a few times, but it's because they are very important. They are simple and they are straightforward, but it's important that you follow them as they are prescribed. The presiding officer, and that means the president, is going to call the chairman of the nominating committee forward to present the report to the general membership. Now, your election is going to take place at a general membership meeting. So the chairman's going to present that report to the general membership. Once the chairman makes the report, they sit down and their job is finished. If there's only one nominee for each office and there haven't been any nominations from the floor, then a voice vote can be held. And that means the president will say, all those in favor of Jane Smith, please say aye. People say aye. All those opposed say no. Actually, you don't say well, any opposed, especially if there's one, because the person is going to be um, elected regardless. Um, then depending on your bylaws, and this has to do with the specifications of running from the floor, if there are any prerequisites for people giving notice in advance. Um, the president will ask if there are further nominations from the floor, and that goes one office at a time. So if it's for the position of president and the bylaws say that your nominations are just taken from the floor without any advance notification, then the um, question will be, Jane Smith has been nominated for the Office of President. Are there any further nominations for the Office of President? 
wait, you know, 15 seconds if they hear nobody. The office of president is closed. All those in favor, please say aye. And then the person is elected. And then in this situation where you have um, nominations required to be submitted in advance, that's at the point in time that the president would say, we have received a nomination from Mary Doe with her intent to run for the position of president. And at that point, you're going to move to a ballot election because you're going to have two individuals running. The presiding officer asks for nominations, and they can be made by any member at the election meeting. So if there was no prerequisite for nominations to be submitted in advance, and the, and the president asks for nominations from the floor, any individual member can nominate a person from the PTA. Um, it doesn't have to be somebody specific. If there are additional nominations, then you must have a ballot election. So that means that people are going to be writing down the name of the individual that they want to elect from that particular for that particular office. And typically, if there are two names, what you're going to do is write one name onto the ballot. Oh no. And I'm going to discuss in a moment what happens with a ballot election. If for some reason the nominating committee comes in with a an unfilled position, so let's say they couldn't find an individual for the position of vice president, when they make their report with all of the other positions, they're going to say vice president, no one nominated. And what will happen at that point is then the president will ask for nominations from the floor for the position of vice president. And I would recommend to you, if at all possible, that that situation be avoided because that's when you can have any anybody <laughs> come forward and be elected into a position. So it really is best for the nominating committee to have a nominee for each particular position. Sometimes it happens, and then what will happen is you're going to elect whoever whoever's name is put forward. If for some reason nobody nominates an individual, what will happen is at every following executive board meeting, the first thing that the president will do is open up nominations for that particular vacant position. And so that will happen each month until the position is filled. That does not happen very often, um, but if that were the case, that is how it would be handled. If there's going to be a ballot vote, the secretary is going to be prepared with ballots for the election. And the secretary should have a few different ballots available in the event that you're going to hold more than one ballot vote. And typically what you do is you would have different colored papers so that you can differentiate between the election for a vice president, or if it turns out that there's a tie and you have to have a second ballot for that particular position, you wouldn't want to have it on the same color paper because it would become confusing and somebody might have an accusation about something being done improperly. Um, you're going to be sure to have a procedure for distributing and collecting the ballots. And this is something that could be in your nominating committee guidelines or procedures that your PTA should put together. Um, the tellers are to be appointed by the president, and anyone who is a nominee for an officer position should not be, or they should not be involved in the election process in any way, and they certainly should not be um, a teller. The individuals who are eligible to vote in a ballot vote need to be members of your PTA unit. And so your um, membership chair should provide a copy of the membership list so that you're sure that everybody receiving um, a ballot is an actual member. Um, afterwards, the ballots are given to the, well, the ballots are given to the teller by the secretary and they will hand them out to the me members who are eligible to vote. Um, the ballots are then collected by the teller or sometimes you may have a ballot box that people can put their ballot into. And then the tellers are going to leave the room and use a tally sheet to count up all of the ballots to determine who the winner of the election is. The individual who has a majority votes is the winner, and that means whatever the number of votes are that you have taken, half of that 
plus one counts as a majority. So if you had had 20 votes cast, 11 would be considered a majority vote. If a ballot comes out without anything written on it, it's a blank ballot and it's not counted. A ballot has that has more than one name written on it or the name is not complete is considered an illegal ballot and that wouldn't be counted. Sometimes you do need to take a revote, and that would be in an instance where there's been a tie. So if you had 20 people voting and 10 voted for one individual and 10 for another, you would need to revote on that. And then at the end of the meeting, somebody needs to make a motion to destroy the ballots um, so that those do not have to be carried around by the secretary forever. The election is always going to be valid as long as you have a quorum at your meeting and your quorum is listed in your bylaws. That means how many people need to be present for a meeting to conduct business. Um, as long as you have the quorum, it doesn't, the number of people who vote can be less than the number of that are there as the quorum, but you have to have a quorum in order to conduct the business. Once the ballots have been tallied, the um, teller will give the results to the president and the president is going to re announce the results of that election. Um, the, re the results of that are going to be recorded in the minutes. That's something that you want to have in your permanent record. And then finally, you have completed your responsibility as part of the nominating committee, and you should be proud of your participation. Now, I know that a few questions have come in. I see there's one here from Christine. If the bylaws call for a two-year term, and those position, are those positions still open for recommendations or only vacant positions? And the answer to that is no, those positions are not open for recommendations, only the positions that have time available on them. So if a person was elected to a two-year term and they're only one year into the term, that term is not completed yet. So that would not be up for um, nomination. So no recommendation would go out for that. The next question that I see here is my unit bylaws state the slate of nominees has to be completed two weeks before our March meeting. We are within that two-week period now. The slate will be completed this Sunday. Can we report the slate and vote at the meeting in March, or do we have to wait until the April meeting to vote? So it says that, can that person, TC, can you say when it tells you that you have to elect? Um, because you're telling me that it has to be reported at the March meeting. It typically would say that your election is in at that same time, I'm thinking that your your bylaws might be saying that the report has to be given in March. And then if your general membership meeting is in April, the election would be in April. I'm going to go out of the PowerPoint now and see if I can see any other questions that may have come up. Okay. And I'm going to scroll up because, oh boy, my unit bylaws. Our term is defined as two years in the bylaws. Can someone be eligible again? Okay, so if you, I'm looking at the question by Meg. If our term is defined as two years in the bylaws, then can someone be eligible again? So I think what you're asking is, can that person be eligible for another position? They could be eligible for another position, um, not the same one that they just filled. If that's not your question, please type in again further down and I'll get to that. What is the course of action if no one is interested or willing to serve on a nominating committee? We're a very small unit and struggling in every aspect, this being one of the main issues. Okay, so right now for this year, you're gonna to have to deal with it, but I would suggest that for the future, you have your bylaws amended so that your nominating committee is made a little smaller, possibly to three individuals rather than five, so that you would be able to um, have individuals serve on the committee. Uh, do we receive this presentation in email? Are you talking about the PowerPoint, Eileen? <laughs> Eileen, if you could answer if it's about the PowerPoint. I don't think we put the PowerPoint in the 
um, pre in the email. Amy, can you answer me on that? I sent the PDF of the slides, but I'm going to put a recording of this webinar up on the website tomorrow, and I posted a link to where it will be up up on the up in the chat box. Okay. So the PowerPoint presentation slides were sent in the email that you received with all of the other documents, and then um, on our website, all of this information will be there as well. If we have co-presidents in our bylaws, can anyone run for a co-president position or do individuals need to run as a unit together as co-presidents? Individuals need to run together as a unit as co-presidents. And you cannot have somebody run against one of the um, individuals. If there's going to be a nomination against it, it has to be two other individuals. You cannot mix and match with co-presidents. Um, I typically do not recommend that PTAs have co-presidents. You're sort of wasting leadership that way. You can utilize a vice president to be an assistant to the president, and they are learning along the way. But um, they cannot. you cannot have one person run to fill one of the poor, one of the seats of the co-presidency. Can people give us five dollars and an application at the meeting to get to be able to be a member so they can vote. Okay, so PTA membership is supposed to be open and available at all times. Some units though have had experiences where people will come in on the night of an election and purchase memberships to make the election go in one way rather than another. So the way that you would not have that happen would be to have something in your procedures saying that um, membership will only be sold you know, up until a certain point in time um, prior to an election meeting. Can our current secretary or treasurer be chairman of the nominating committee and can members of the nominating committee be nominated? Excellent question here. Um, your secretary or treasurer can be nominated to be the chairman of the nominating committee. They would be representative of the executive board. The only individual who cannot serve on the nominating committee is a president. Um, so those individuals could serve in that capacity. And yes, members of the nominating committee can be nominated for positions. By serving on the committee, you do not have your rights as a member taken away um, from you. That would be um, penalizing you for serving on the nominating committee. The only thing about that is if an individual who is on the committee is being considered for nomination, they need to leave the room while the remaining members of the nominating committee discuss that person as a possible nominee. When they finish their deliberation, they bring the person back into the room, and if they decided that they want to nominate that person, they would offer them that position at that time. Uh, TC, the election meeting is in March. So no, if your election meeting is in March and you're supposed to report in March, then you have to do both at the same time. I realize that your turnaround time is pretty quick here, but fortunately with electronic communication, you can um, share the, the um, proposed slate of officers that way and then get everything out in hard copy or post it in your school building on Monday. So I hope you have enough time to get this all done. Um, we were supposed to report two weeks prior to the March meeting. So I'm not sure when your March meeting is, um, hopefully it's two weeks from now, though. <laughs> How are the two members of the board selected for the nominating committee? At a regular board meeting, can the board discuss which officers hope to return to the board? Okay, the members of the executive board are elected at an executive board meeting. The members from the general membership are elected at the general membership meeting. And at a regular board meeting, it would not be proper um, for the board to discuss which officers hope, oh, this just moved on me, which hope to return to the board. When the recommendation forms go out, the individuals who are currently serving as officers should submit a letter of intent on their own if they are interested in continuing or moving into another position on the board. If you serve your two-year term as treasurer, then in year three serve as secretary, can you be elected as treasurer again in year four? The answer, the short answer is yes, you could do that, but it's not really advisable for you to be flipping back and forth. Can you hear me now? Somebody said they can't hear me. I'm sorry if that was the case. Um, 
then in year three serve as secretary. So you would you would be able to do that, but it would not be recommended that you do that. What I'm going to do is before we close this out, I'm going to type up the answers to all of these questions in case you were unable to hear me, and we will send it in an email to those people um, who participated in the call. Back to our question regarding the two members of the board being selected. What is the exact procedure? Do we nominate by ballot? Two members of the board are going to be you're talking about nominated to the nominating committee, correct? Laura, can you just answer? Okay. So they would be elected at a an executive board meeting, and you should use um, a ballot. If you only have two members that are being elected and you are not electing an alternate, then that you can put two members' names in, and it could be a voice vote, and they would both be elected to the committee. If there's a situation where you do have the ability to, hello, hello, can you hear me? I think maybe yes. Liz's, okay. I think maybe it's just on Liz's line. Liz, we're gonna put, let me type it. Amy, can you type in there that we're gonna put answers to all of these questions? Certainly. And we'll email it out to everybody. Thank yeah. you so much. I'm gonna okay. I think I'm gonna have to email it to everybody. I got. I did get a screenshot of who is on, but I can't always tell who, who okay. Linda or Linda we, well, was. Well, we could just send it to. We can send it out to the attendees. Mm -hmm. So let me just see where that question was. It was about electing somebody. So in the event that you are able to have um, alternates elected, that's when you would use a ballot vote. Okay. We do have copies of sample ballots. We'll attach that. Those will put on the web page. I'm sorry that I didn't include that as a handout, but I do think in the resource guide, let me just open up that particular handout. Um, I believe that that was <coughs> included in the resource guide. Let's just go through here really quickly. I think it was towards the end. Uh, here you go. Here's a sample ballot. Can everybody see that? So that is in the resource guide. Okay. Can presidents vote on the ballot to elect nomination committee? Yes, absolutely, a president can vote. A president doesn't lose their ability to uh, participate in the voting process, especially if it's by ballot. Typically though, when you have other types of vote, votes that take place, the president would vote to break a tie. But to um, have a ballot election for members to be elected to the nominating committee and in the officer elections, the president can vote, yes. Any other questions out there? Well, I do hope that you found this to be an informative presentation and that your questions have been answered. Um, but certainly if you, one more question, go ahead, Laura. Um, if you read through that section of the resource guide, it is very thorough and it should be able to um, explain everything to you. We'll wait here for Laura's question. And certainly you can email me. My email address is pastpresident at newyorkstatepta.org and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And again, your region directors are able to assist you with any other information that you may need. Um, and I hope that everybody, okay, can a PTA president serve as president of more than one PTA at the same time? Absolutely, there's no rule anywhere saying that you can't do that. The only thing is make sure that you have enough time to be able to do the work um, of both of those PTA units, but there is no rule anywhere saying that um, a person can't serve as president in more than one unit at the same time. Do standing committees get elected by the current board for the following year or by the new board after the election for the following year? Typically, your executive committee, that means your officers, um, appoint those committees. That's not something that is typically elected unless your particular PTA unit has that in your procedure somewhere, but typically the committees are not elected. So if you're having an issue with that in your PTA, um, I would recommend that you reach out to your region director because there may be, you know, they're appointed. Um, yeah, they're appointed. 
So, Elizabeth, I would just recommend that you reach out to your region director because I'm not sure if there's more to um, what you're asking here or if there's an actual situation going on in your PTA unit. Uh, do you have a sample of policies and procedures for us to create to use for our own nominating committee? In that section of the resource guide there, there are um, some procedures there. I'm not sure if they speak about nominating committee procedures, but if we don't have something, we definitely can make that available and we'll get it in the, um, the leadership section of the website. I will make sure to pass that information along to our um, bylaws committee on New York State PTA. Sorry, this Facebook thing keeps popping up. Okay, are there any further questions? Okay. <clears throat> see above, Laura, see above. Ah. So you recommend our unit to go ahead with the election meeting on March 12th. The slate was supposed to be published on Fe Oh, I thought you said that the slate was supposed to be published in March and then two weeks later was going to be. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you you uh, your slate was supposed to be published on February 26th. Um, one thing that you could do is possibly move the meeting date in March to later in March so that you fulfill that time requirement. That would be one recommendation that I would make to you, TC. Um, that way you would have it still in March and you would meet the requirements. Um, but in this instance, I would definitely get in touch with your region director or if your unit has an associate director or an assistant director assigned to it, contact them directly so that they can help you with this. And then Laura is asking for a sample of policies and procedures for us to use to create our nominating committee. Um, I would just take a look in that resource guide section because there are samples of procedures in there. I'm just not sure of if there's something for nominating committee. If there is not, I'm going to take a look at it after we're off of this call. If there is not, we're going to make sure to get something together for everybody and we'll have it posted in our um, leader section of the, of the website. My entire board, with the exception of the treasurer, has just been elected this year. I believe all positions are a two-year commitment, but I will double check with the bylaws. Does this mean only the position we are open to is treasurer? If that's the case, that it's a two-year term and they are all only in the first year of the term, then the only one open would be p the treasurer. But please read your bylaws very carefully um, and connect with your region on that because they'll be able to walk you through that to be sure that you're nominating exactly um, which position is supposed to be nominated. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you very much to everybody for joining the presentation. Okay, fantastic. I know president is two year. I will double check the rest. Terrific. Okay, thanks again, everybody. Bye Thank now. You. Amy, Amy, don't close this out so we can capture all the questions. Okay. Oh, I'm just uh, I'm just gonna let it go for a little while longer so the chat can you can maybe see it and see the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. This is Antoinette. Thank you for a great job. Oh, thank you. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night. Oh, so Antoinette, you heard what that request was about procedures for the nominating committee. I'm not sure if we have that in the resource mm. guide. Okay. And if we don't, that's something that we definitely should get together. Yeah. Yeah. Procedures. Thank you, ladies. I'll definitely, um, if you don't mind, like, if I could um, email you or see if we can talk to see how to make that happen exactly. Definitely. Okay. I'm gonna Definitely. I'm gonna pause this. So thank you. Wrap up the video. Right.